Yeah. Well, let's open it up for questions now. And um, Beth and Alan, uh, please, please come back on. Um, those of you listening, please feel free to put your questions in, in the chat. And I just have one question for you, Alan, to kick it off. Um, I found it very interesting in your book that um, these journalists, while they were complaining about all oh, how they were, they couldn't get to where the story was, they were living in the metropole, as you point out, with a lot of Stalin cronies. If they knew Russian, they could have talked to them in the elevator. Um, now, obviously, the people might not have spoken to them, but, you know, it, it's just interesting in the different periods of how people, you know, decided to do reporting. They're all there. They want to cover the war. They could have had all these scoops talking to, uh, you know, people who were in Stalin's cohort. Well, it was a strange feature of the Metropole that there were these invisible walls uh, between, yeah, the, the, uh, they didn't live separately, but they sort of existed separately. All the, all the, all the foreigners would be, uh, all the foreign journalists, they would drink somewhere different every night. And uh, from time to time, they would uh, be walking down the corridor. If you remember, the corridors are extremely wide and they're wide enough uh, for two people to play chess. And uh, they might uh, pass uh, a couple of people, one quite corpulent playing chess, and they wouldn't notice them. They wouldn't talk to them. Uh, apart, None of them spoke good Russian apart from Alexander Vert, um, but uh, he was uh, born in Petersburg, but, uh, but a Brit. Anyway, but um, of course, the corpulent man playing, playing chess uh, was none other uh, than the man who had signed uh, several thousand death certificates uh, in the uh, uh, in 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 the purges he had a grace and favor uh, apartment in the metropole and he stayed there until till after the war and not a single journalist knew that if they wanted to find out what had happened in the purges this was the man to ask but he was um very unnoticeable he had a very garrulous wife uh, he used to talk not to the not to the uh, journalist but to other people uh, talk about this and that and she would tell everyone that she'd been the Lenin secretary and uh, she did all the talking and he just played chess and he had a butterfly connection a collection which he looked after but in the daytime he was signing death certificates basically so uh, extraordinary that uh, these they were like sort of oil and water uh, in the metaphor. Yeah. So we have a question from James Brooke, um, who is asking you, Alan, in the movie, Mr. Jones, how accurate was the portrayal of the Hotel Metropole? Um, I did see that. Um, I saw a, 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 busy, uh, a busy scene uh, in front uh, of the cashiers. And I remember some, some fairly uh, insalubrious and insalubrious parties given by Walter Walter Durante, I seem to recall. Though Durante didn't, uh, uh, before 1941, uh, uh, permanent correspondents such as uh, Walter Durante didn't live in the metropole. It was only when, uh, in wartime, when they really needed to keep an to keep an to keep an eye on them. Um, um, of course. Um, Anyone who wants to see uh, a new representation of the Metropole uh, will be able to see on March 29th uh, the TV uh, the TV series based on a gentleman in Moscow, Amor Tolls's multi-million book, uh, million-selling uh, novel will be available for for, for streaming. Uh, for in, if there are any Brits listening, um, the outdoor shots. Uh, which were um, were taken in the north of England in Bolton, which has a very grand town hall dating from Victorian times. Anyway, so that'll be another 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 opportunity to uh, uh, to see the, the metropole represented. Though uh, 
it's more a magical metropole than the real one, of course. Mm -hmm. Magical mm -hmm. metropole. A magical realist metropole. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing it anyway. anyway. Good. Um, Paul, one thing we didn't discuss about your book is is the uh, the warriors, mm. and I I didn't realize until I read your book that um, that there were some exiled Russians who created a system to attack Russian drones in Ukraine and mm -hmm. take out a lot mm. of them. Could could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I read into this uh, guy who's kind of a brilliant Russian uh, physicist who grew up in Siberia, uh, Mikhail, and uh, kind of a Siberian nationalist. I mean, his his whole belief is that you know Russia should be, is too big; it should be broken up, and Siberia should rule itself in a kind of liberal Western style way. Anyway, he became an early opponent of Putin's regime, uh, as he would call it, and got into all kinds of opposition activities and went into exile and was living in Switzerland when the invasion happened and linked up with a friend of his who was a Ukrainian physicist. And together, they devised this system made up of noise sensors, basically microphones, which were, the system was manufactured in, in, in Kiev and it was strung along, you know, cell towers and things like that to identify by noise incoming Russian uh, missiles and and drones and uh, saving civilian lives. Undoubtedly, I was in Ukraine uh, this past September, and you know we had quite a light show at about four o'clock in the morning from the balcony of my hotel in in Kiev. And I thought of them. I mean, I'm sure there are now more established systems available, but this was early in the war, and it really contributed. And one thing that the Ukrainian physicist told me of his friend, he said Mikhail was in some ways a better friend to Ukraine than some Ukrainians, because it's not often talked about. There were a lot, quite a number of, of military age Ukrainians, you know, fled the country and are still outside of Ukraine. It's kind of a problem. Uh, so my guy, Mikhail, was one of these warriors. And, you know, it's an interesting ethical issue as well, because he was clear that he was thought he was saving Ukrainian lives and not killing Russian soldiers. But there are other Russian exiles who are quite happy to kill the Russian soldiers. I mean, they will pay and finance for Ukraine, you know, like tank killing equipment and stuff like that. I mean, the battle is joined. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, we have we have a question from Yvonne Murray in Australia. She says, could the panelists please comment on the modern day Western apologists for Russia's regime? Do they have any influence inside Russia? And also, are they similar to the apologists of previous eras? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Do you, what, Alan? Do you have any? I can. I could answer. Alan, do you have any thoughts? Well, I well, um, if you're talking about the ninth, the the nineteen thirties, um, uh, the apologists or what? Lenin called the useful idiots. Um, some of some of them uh, had strong um, beliefs in socialism. Uh, uh, capitalism had really fallen on it fallen on its knees from 1929. So it was you know there was a reason to be looking for a different way of organizing things. So you can understand that uh, people uh, might want to, want to go to Russia and uh, be told that it was the it was the the future hope of uh, of humanity um but when when i see tucker carlson i don't see what the ideological basis of it um i mean obviously there's a great desire um, i'm not in america a great desire to be to be to be different to be loved to be you know someone someone important um but uh, I don't see any um, any ideological any 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 justification for that. Um, uh, and when when you s I saw his uh, his long so-called interview with Putin, and Putin just sort of embarrassed him, really, didn't he? he gave him uh, a yeah. half-hour-long half history 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 lesson. Um, so 
uh, Tucker Carlson looked ridiculous and um, Putin looked like a sort of um, gibbering old geezer. Anyway, what do you think? Um, I would draw one distinction. I think that the Western apologists of the earlier time, at least in the Soviet time, were a number of them genuinely, you know, however misguidingly uh, enamored of the Soviet, you know, classless society as they saw it in comparison to the decadent, you know, capitalist society of places including England and Cambridge and so forth. Whereas today, I think there is a somewhat ideological dynamic, although it didn't certainly didn't come out in Tucker Carlson's interview, but the conservative some conservatives in in America see a kind of anti-woke, as they might describe it, kind of system at work in Russia and also in Hungary. And Putin, for example, has been notably hostile to, you know, gay people. I mean, just anything that's associated with sort of the pro progressive Western values as we now define them, same-sex marriage and so forth. Russia is a very, still very pa patriarchal place with, I think, an influence of the Orthodox Christian heritage. And I think that probably appeals to people like Tucker Carlson. I mean, he also, I think, has slobbered over Orban in Hungary on sort of the same principles. So they think that they're somehow maybe trolling the libs or something in America by bowing to Putin in this kind of weird, somewhat conservative values agenda. There's some strange stuff going on. There was this so-called naked party in Moscow that got a lot of attention that uh, and it's not the only one. And people are talking about, yeah, I mean, you know, it's Moscow, for goodness sake. I mean, stuff like that probably happens in New York, you know, every night of the week. But it got back to Putin and somehow he went nuts and everyone has had to sort of slavishly apologize for their, you know, participation in the naked party. So I think there's a kind of a strange dynamic going on there.